Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We're delighted that you are here at this time and in this place. Uh, we're blessed by your presence. I want to draw your attention to some things going on in the life of the church. We have had a series of what will be three forums following worship on Sunday mornings about what's the future for the United Methodist Church in the midst of many uh, conversations about full inclusion and what does that mean for us. Um, this Sunday, following this worship service at 1010, we will have a forum here in the sanctuary and we'll do some talking about how it is Christ United Methodist Church will move through a very ambiguous time. There is nothing clear uh, in the world, basically, around uh, where the United Methodist Church will be even a year from now. Uh, and so we'll need to do some talking about how we want to move through together. So I hope that you will stay following worship. Um, Cooper's daughter got married yesterday, and so um, we were charged with bringing popcorn to the reception. I got so many bags of Carol's corn. So you can go out, get some Carol's corn, uh, and then come back. But don't go out right away because we will be welcoming new members in the Hewittsons as uh, new members of Christ United Methodist Church following the postlude. So you have your itinerary, right? Stay for the welcoming of members. Go out and get Carol's corn. Don't tell the janitors I said it was okay. Bring the Carol's corn back in uh, and your coffee, and then we'll have a time of gathering together. I want to thank the Reverend Kendall Hughes uh, for preaching this morning. Kendall's a retired United Methodist clergy person who is a member of our community, uh, and uh, we are so blessed to have him here. So I'm really grateful that you're preaching this morning. Um, I'd like to let you know that uh, we received word that the Reverend Bob Scoggin has died. Yes. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the history of Christ United Methodist Church, Bob Scoggin uh, was the minister of music here for decades. How many of you uh, either were a singer or a ringer under his direction? Will you raise your hand? Look around you. Uh, he is still in this space. Uh, I want you to know that he died at Charter House playing hand chimes. So God is good. Seriously. He was doing what he loved to do. Uh, and certainly what he loved to do blessed this church immensely. So we'll keep you posted as far as services of worship to celebrate his life and our, gra our gratitude to God. Uh, but please keep Bob's family in your prayers and all of us uh, touched by the power of his witness. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, we rise as you're able and let us call ourselves into this time of worship. We gather this day to worship. May the peace of God rest upon our busy lives so that we may be quieted into prayer. May the love of God flow through our worship words, that they may be alive with the opportunities for service. May the grace of God seek out our every need, and may the restless gospel set our hearts afire. Amen and amen. Let us worship our God.
seated. And I invite you to join me, please, into a time of prayer. Gracious God, you gift us new every morning with the breath of your love. You gift us with the song of children, with the sweetness of a breeze on a hot summer day, with people in our lives who teach us how to open our hearts and sing your praise. And so we commend to you on this morning our brother Bob. And we thank you for the many ways he conspired with you to unleash the power of the Holy Spirit through song and through ringing and through his work on that organ bench. We thank you for receiving him into your care. And we hear your amen. <laughs> we ask too, would you be with our current music director, Beth Joyner, as she seeks healing and help her to know how she too is part of a long lineage of those who plant our, the song of your praise in the hearts of those who need and long to lean toward you. So please grant those who seek to help her heal wisdom and help her to know our prayers and our love are with her in this time of healing. We thank you for Lyle and Betty for 75 years of loving each other and getting along mostly, as we all do when we commit to unwrapping life together. Thank you for their long witness, for the power of the gospel and the way it's lived out in our churches and in our homes. Keep us mindful, Holy One, that you call to us each and all, every day. And so you call us to lean toward you in prayer. And we pray together on this day in the ways inspired by your Son as we say together, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, holy and blessed is your true name. We pray for your reign of peace to come we pray that your good will be done. Let heaven and earth become one. Give us this day the bread we need. Give it to those who have none. Let forgiveness flow like a river between us, from each one to each one. Lead us to holy innocence beyond the evil of our days. Come swiftly, Mother, Father, come. For yours is the power and the glory and the mercy. Forever your name is all in one. Amen. I would like to invite the children forward, please. Do we have kittles? I heard them. Come on up, come on up, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, what I wanna say to you today is a very short little lesson. Do you see what I have here in this, ba in this basket? What are these in this packet? Fruit snacks, and what do you love about fruit snacks? They're yummy. Why are they yummy? Because, it, because they have good stuff in them. They have good stuff in them, and they're really sweet. How many of you like sweet things? Come now, boys and girls. How many of you like sweet things? Yes, there you have it. So what I want you to know, the only thing you have to remember from today is that you're going to hear about how it is that um, God believes that you, in the middle of your whole being, in all of you, you are made in sweetness. Can you remember that? Repeat after me. I, I am, made am made in sweetness. In sweetness. We're going to do it together. I, I 
am made in sweetness. So, like these little fruit snacks, you are delicious and lovely and beautiful, and God adores you. So let's pray together, okay? I know there's more. Dear God, thank you for planting inside of us the power of your heart and the goodness of Jesus Christ and help us to believe in our own sweetness in order that we share it with others. Amen and amen. And there's lots of fruit snacks in here, so you might want to share, but you don't have to. I'm just saying, sometimes you don't always have to. All right, you can go back. Thank you. of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. The morning sun with golden beam. The silver moon with softer gleam. Thanks to Bob Gardner and both of you whose names I do not know, but God does. Bob was willing to help us out when Beth became ill and, uh, as always, brings such beauty into this time of worship. Would you join me, please, as we continue praising God through the Psalms? And you will find uh, the psalm on page 806 in the bulletin, or pardon me, in your hymnal. John will play the response through once, and we will sing it together. And then we will pray these powerful words about how it is 
God's vision is that righteousness and peace will kiss each other. to your land, you restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. hear what God will speak, for the Lord will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to the Lord in their hearts. Surely salvation is at hand for those who fear the Lord, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before the Lord and make God's footsteps away. Sunday we heard how it is Jesus was at the home of Mary and Martha and he goes from that place and teaches his disciples that God is evermore as ready to hear our prayers as we are to remember to pray. Jesus was praying in a certain place and after he had finished one of his disciples said to him Lord teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And Jesus said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to your friend at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers, your friend does, from within the house, do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whenever he asks. 
So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be open to them. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asked for a fish, would give your child a snake instead? Or if the child asked for an egg, would you give your child a scorpion? If then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your own children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? May God add a blessing to the reading of these words. Would you sing with me, please? The hymn is found in the small black hymnal in your pews. Would you rise? may be seated. Sometimes I feel like I want to take the words of a hymn like that and put them on my refrigerator and in my heart. We bear witness to the Christ who is present in all seasons of our physical life and in all seasons of our church life and in all seasons of this creation that we are called to tend. So as we enter into this time of offering, consider how it is you are blessing in this world 
the ways that you share how God has created you, unique, fine, precious, sweet, and how we get to join together and make good music out of our sweetness and our song. Let us enter into a time of offering. in times of trouble mother mary comes to me speaking words of wisdom let it be and in my hour of darkness she is standing right in front of me speaking words of wisdom let it be let it be let it be be whisper words of wisdom let it be and when the broken-hearted people living in the world agree there will be an answer let it be for though they may be parted there is still a chance that they will see there will be an answer, let it be, 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 there will be an answer, let it be.
Gracious God, you have taught us that all that we need, you have provided. Give us the courage to lean into that. Help us to ask for what we need, to search out your will for our lives, and to open the doors of our hearts to possibilities, and to the ways you call us each and all to live, to live fully, courageously, and in the ways of your Son, Jesus Christ. Would you hear our prayer as we pray together? Giving God, you have blessed us with restless spirits and expansive hearts. Work within and through us, we pray. From the abundance of your giving, may we share our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness in order that your will be done on earth. Amen. You may be seated. The context for our reading from the epistle this morning is that the writer is addressing a smaller group of Christians, a small church in Colossia that is surrounded by a larger context of a, a religion that was called Gnosticism. And the writer is trying to help these Christians hold on to a, a Christian worldview in the midst of this worldview that saw the spiritual, the spiritual as what was mattered and that the material world did not matter. I mean, I will kind of unpack the way that they uh, thought, the folks in Colossia thought, and how the writer was calling them to a way of thinking that was truly, purely Christian and incarnational. They believed that the spiritual, the spiritual world was what was real and that the material world was unimportant or even, even evil. And this is a way of, of thinking that maybe we who live in a materialistic kind of a world say, well, does that even exist today? And, and yes, it does. It does in many parts of Africa, in Asia, some parts of Latin America, and in much of uh, Christianity that is a more maybe internal uh, save the soul, but don't worry so much about the whole person kind of faith. And one of the things, in fact, that drew me to, uh, to this church, to uh, Christ United Methodist Church, was the fact that it does not just look at the spiritual side of people, but that it is involved in the whole person and, and social and environmental uh, activism. This, this week, I had, the, this past week, I had the chance to be at a, a forum over at uh, Pasquale's. It was a packed forum dealing with the issue of uh, homelessness. And there were other members of our church there and afterwards, I had a conversation with one of the main presenters who's very uh, the foremost of this issue of homelessness. And when I mentioned I was with Christ United Methodist Church, he said, oh, yes, the, the Saturday noon meals and knew about the work that we're doing here to uh, deal with real practical social issues. And the writer that we're going to be reading here was uh, saying that you can't just look at the spiritual. The spiritual is important, but it has to be more integrated and appreciate that, uh, yes, the material matters. And, and as we who live in this materialistic world, we know that that uh, is something that has brought us science, has brought us medicine, there is much good. But again, the writer would be saying to us also, don't just rely on one side, the material or the spiritual. They were also in Colossia dealing with a, another version of a worldview, which is what's called the priestly worldview. And in the priestly, the priests are those who are often educated, sophisticated people that try to bring the material and the spiritual world together to be mediators. And they're often uh, people who are, are very skilled at this and help. But the, as you can imagine, they also can be in a place of power where the, uh, those who hold to and consume of that worldview, that priestly worldview, become consumers, become ones who sit back and these others have the power, the knowledge to bring the two worlds together. But this writing, as you'll see here, is rejecting that the two worlds need to be brought together because it says that you know, religion, which is religio, to, uh, to reconnect, 
that it never was divided, is what he's saying, that in Christ, all things are together in the incarnation. And so this is the, the context in which the scripture is written. So hear and listen for the word of the Lord. Colossians chapter two. My counsel for you is simple and straightforward. Just go ahead with what you've been given. You received Christ Jesus, the master. Now live him. You're deeply rooted in him. You're well constructed upon him. You know your way around the faith. Now do what you've been taught. School's out. Quit studying the subject and start living it. And let your living spill over into thanksgiving. Watch out for people who try to dazzle you with big words and intellectual double talk. They want to drag you off into endless arguments that never amount to anything. They spread their ideas through the empty traditions of human beings and empty superstitions of spirit beings. But that's not the way of Christ. Everything of God gets expressed in him so you can see and hear him clearly. You don't need a telescope, a microscope, or a horoscope to realize the fullness of Christ and the emptiness of the world, the universe without him. When you come to him, that fullness comes together for you too. His power extends over everything. Entering into his fullness is not something you figure out or achieve. It's not a matter of being circumcised or keeping a long list of laws. No, you're already in it, insiders, not through some secret initiation rite, but rather through what Christ has already done through you and for you, destroying the power of sin. If it's an initiation ritual you're after, you've already been through it by submitting to baptism. Going under the water was a burial to your old life. Coming up out of it was resurrection. God raising you from the dead as he did Christ. When you were stuck in your old dead sin life, you were incapable of responding to God. God brought you alive right along with Christ. Think of it, all your sins forgiven, the slate wiped clean, that old arrest warrant canceled and nailed to the cross. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. So don't put up with anyone pressuring you for details of diet, worship services, or holy days. Those things are mere shadows cast before what was to come. The substance is Christ. Don't tolerate people who try to run your life, ordering you to bow and scrape insisting that you join their obsession with angels and seek out visions. They're a lot of hot air. That's all they are. They're completely out of touch with the source of life. Christ, who puts us together in one piece, whose very breath and blood flow through us. He is the head, we are the body. We can grow up healthy in God only as he nourishes us. So what had happened in Colossia is similar to what is happening in the United Methodist denomination. There was an old order of Gnosticism of this priestly worldview and consciousness had encountered something new, something that shook up their old order, something they hadn't dealt with before. For them, it was incarnational Christianity. And the old order had a choice. It could embrace and include this new reality into their reality, or it could revert back to the old order, to the old stage. But now that it encountered something new, that old stage was no longer just something benign and giving them order. It became something in which they reacted to the new in a moralistic, a judging, a critiquing and evaluating way, looking at this new thing and evaluating and to determine if it was in or out within their codes. And that's what the Colossians were encountering with others who, who were in, looking at this new thing. They had this choice. See, there really are for all of us three stages 
that we pass through. The first and the last are the ones that may be the longest and the middle shorter sometimes. But the first stage is a stage that we come up in, that we're taught, that gives us order. Our, our worldview, whatever it may be, that our parents, that our society passes on to us. And it's good. It's necessary. We need that first stage of life to get some foundation and some roots and to do and to be. There's much good in that first order. But then if we live long enough, we all encounter something that blows up that first order, something that's new that challenges a cherished belief. We, we, we meet a new culture. A new culture comes to us. We have a fall in our life, some kind of a crisis. We encounter our own addictions, our own weakness, and we have some kind of a fall in our, our life that breaks it all up. There's some kind of a, uh, we may be confronting our own mortality, something that causes a break, a fall in the middle. Mine was so painful it ended me up in the psych ward for a while that we, it all falls apart. And then we have a choice. Well, what do we do? Do we go back to the old and look at the new and judge it and reject it? Or do we move on to the third stage? The third stage, which is the stage of reorder. So there's order, there's disorder, and then there's reorder. One or the other. If we turn to the first, it becomes moralism, power and control. If we move on to the next, it's the incarnational Christianity, the, uh, the worldview that sees that Christ has brought matter and spirit together, that they were never separate. It's a new way of thinking that is manifested not through uh, clergy and experts, but through a growth in consciousness and in love. Not through joining, but through seeing and growing in love and consciousness. We have either the choice to move from uh, that disorder back to the stage which becomes moralism or to move on to the third stage, which is a, a kind of mysticism. Richard Rohr writes, the incarnational worldview grounds Christian holiness in objective reality instead of just moral behavior. This is where it goes deep enough to strike pay dirt. Yet this is the depth that many have not reached. Those who have can feel as holy on a hospital bed or in a tavern as in a chapel. They can love and forgive themselves and all other imperfect things because all carry the image of God equally, if not perfectly. Incarnational Christ consciousness will normally move towards direct, social, practical, and immediate action. It is never an abstraction or theory. If it is truly incarnational Christianity, it is always a take action religion, not solely esoteric belief systems or priestly mediations. He goes on to say Christians found, Christianity's foundational belief is always incarnation, the bringing together. Yet Christians in the West, we have focused on abstract ideas instead of actual transformation of our own incarnate humanity. But now what has happened in our world is that this very humanity has grown tired of disembodied spiritualism that are out there that allow for no verification in experience. So many religions hide their actual agenda, which now has become power and control, distracting us from what is right in front of us. That's what we do when we, we put our emphasis on a gospel that is out there as opposed to in here. The word disembodied spirituality is for me, I interpret that to mean stories such as the supernatural stories that can be very good theological symbolism, but unless they translate into action, real humility, real vulnerability, they're largely, as Isaiah says, simply a mere lesson memorized, and they don't save anyone. And uh, for example, last week, a friend of mine asked me while we were out kayaking what I thought about the uh, teaching that Jesus walked on water. And I said, you know, it's maybe not a, a harmful belief, but it will, in fact, probably a belief that will leave you and the world largely unchanged. I said, I see it rather as a parable 
a parable of that. Jesus does uh, not need a, a mediator or a boat or anything between him, the spiritual and, and the physical, that they, they come together in Christ and there's no competition between them. See, this kind of a, of a belief that that is symbolic of the two coming together, matter and spirit coming together in cooperation and harmony is, is something that has to do with real life. It's not something that's out there in a belief and something supernatural that happened 2,000 years ago, but it's what we experienced right there on that lake as we saw the spiritual, as we were kayaking there in, in the present in the physical that they were together. This is truly incarnational Christianity. It's a call to action, not mere priestly mediations or esoteric beliefs. So what are some of the ways that we can put this into action? I see it as calling us to transform the systems of suffering around us. I saw this lived out in a man in the first prison where I was a chaplain. We had an inmate there who was a Methodist minister serving a four-year sentence for protesting some of the U.S. systems of suffering. At that time, it was the School of the Americas that was teaching people to, how to torture. And the judge gave him and a, a group of nuns four-year sentences for peacefully marching onto the School of the Americas carrying a coffin. But that, that minister taught me so much. As he was there in the prison, he was involved in, as social, he was there for social action, and while he was there, he was caring for and ministering to, it was like having another chaplain ministering to the men who were around him. And he was also a contemplative. He spent a great amount of his time writing and journaling and, and meditating. He brought it together in action and contemplation. And he would tell you that in that phrase, action and contemplation, the most important word is neither action nor contemplation, it's and. It's the coming together, it's being both and bringing together, like it's Mary and Martha coming together. And me, many Westerners, we are today beginning to find those skills to uh, add to uh, being involved and active, to also to access, ac access things of depth things deep within us, where we find God's spirit. It might be through contemplation, through psychology, spiritual direction, or right here in Rochester, the, the uh, program through integrative health of stress management and um, program they have there that, that teaches us to examine interiority and depth. One of the ways to uh, go deeper is to go deeper in what prayer is. The classic definition that we are taught of prayer is lifting up your mind and heart to God. And as we go deeper, we see it the other way around. We ask ourselves, it's not just when I do the, the prayers as in Sunday school, but it's what is it that lifts my mind and heart up? What is it that lifts me into wonder? And that is prayer. Some of you that go on the uh, camping trip this coming weekend will have that opportunity to do that as you watch the stars or hike a trail or to, to be in wonder and realize that is prayer. God is present there and giving thanks for that and praising it and accepting what is. I love the, the Barbara Brown Taylor quote where she says, my hope is if that I can practice saying thank you now when I still approve of most of what is happening to me, perhaps then that practice will become habit by the time I do not like most of what is happening to me. The plan is to replace approval with gratitude. The plan is to take what is as God's ongoing answer to me, to give thanks for all that is around us, to replace approval with gratitude. So I encourage you to find the way to add to our action and our busyness and, and involvement times of gratitude. To, uh, one of the things they teach in that, the integrative health at Mayo is that the first time, moment you wake up in the morning, before you even open your eyes, as your head's still on the pillow but you're aware you're awake, is to think of five people that you're grateful for and with five breaths just give thanks for five people to begin with gratitude. And that's prayer. That's beginning your day by going deep. 
There's many other ways to do it. I, I was blessed 16 years ago to be sent through my work to uh, St. Benedict's in Madison, Wisconsin to do journaling, to do a week of journaling and learn intensive journaling so I could teach it to the inmates. And it was in that practice that I, 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 I dialogued with things in my own experiences. And still, 16 years later, I'll go back to that journal and find depths and riches there. And it all came for within me and within a reality that was there, a deeper self of going there. And so I would encourage you to find the way that you can practice some contemplative practice of reflecting inside and, and uh, to live it out. I remember a guy that I, that I taught at Leavenworth to journal. His name was Big Jim. He was a Philadelphia uh, mob member who was as taller than me and, and, and uh, twice as wide and a huge guy. But this guy came to depth in journaling. And just this past week, I spoke to him. He's now been out of prison 14 years. And he thanked me. He thanked me for teaching him journaling. And he's journaling, and he's also involved with helping others who are coming out of prison and changing those lives. He's living that out. That's, that's the call that we have. So today, we are cover, recovering permission to use contemplative tools to move towards depth. What a shame it would be if we did not use them. We need to go in so that then we can go out. We need to trust the, the only way up is to go down. Take action. Go deep into nature. Go deep into yourself this week. May it be. Amen.
may your week be full of pauses away from your rush, away from the screens, pauses to be awash in the wonder of nature, in the wonder of your companions, and in the wonders found deep within you. Amen.